Hey you, happy Sunday. You're listening to episode number 107 of the Keto Diet Podcast. Today we're chatting about socializing with keto foods. Is your body actually wrong? Cravings and indulging on keto, getting started with keto, and so much more. Today's podcast extra plus the transcript, which includes all the resources and items that we chatted about today can be found at healthfulpursuit.com slash podcast slash E107. I got one cool thing for you today, and that is that I put together a super free, I don't know what makes it super free, but it's just like free, <laughs> eight step guide to ending your keto weight loss struggles. In the guide, it shows you how hormones play a role in your weight and how to balance them out, the role that stress plays on your ability to become properly fat adapted, how to know if you're eating enough versus too much on your ketogenic diet so you can spark weight loss and so many other cool things. Okay, let's do this thing. Welcome to the Keto Diet Podcast, the show all about keto for women so you can burn fat, balance your hormones, and heal your body. Starting and maintaining keto can be challenging without the right support. So just for listening to the podcast, I want to give you 20% off the keto beginning with the coupon code Keto Podcast. That's all one word. This 30-day program gives you a clear step-by-step how-to so you can quickly adapt to a ketogenic diet, avoid common struggles, and get the results you crave. Go to healthfulpursuit.com slash begin to get your keto beginning discount today. If you're new around these parts, I'm Leanne Vogel. You may know me as the international best-selling author of The Keto Diet, founder of happyketobody.com, or maybe you know me as the nutritionist that likes dipping pork rinds in avocado oil mayo. I'm so glad you're here with me today. Thanks so much for listening. Our guest today is Shelby Strasberger, who is a 26-year-old and has been living the ketogenic lifestyle since February 2018. After landing a 9-to-5 office job where a weekly occurrence, she gained 40 pounds and got to a point where she felt so far from herself. Shelby knew something had to change, and after struggling with yo-yo dieting, misleading tea cleanses, and obsessive macro counting, she discovered keto and has never looked back. For Shelby, keto is not a diet. It's a lifestyle full of ups and downs, and Shelby is more than happy to ride that wave. So I met Shelby at the book signing in Ontario, and I just loved her story. She was so upbeat. Her energy was awesome. And you could just tell that she had a story to tell. So I wanted to have her on the show. So if you're struggling with the restrictive keto rules, a lot of what Shelby and I are chatting about today, and you want more information on how I do keto from more of a holistic healing approach, you can check out pages 10 through 15 of my program, Fat Fueled. So if you already have a copy, head on over to page 10 through to 15. And you don't just need to punish your body or drink detox teas to lose weight. Healing your body comes first. And that's what today's episode is all about. Okay, let's jump to it. Shelby, how's it going? I'm great. How are you, Leanne? I'm so good. Thanks for coming on the show. Oh, anytime. I'm so thrilled to be invited on here. Yeah, we met in Ontario at the book signing and you're just such a wonderful human being. Thank you so much. I didn't expect you to remember who I was at all. And I was so flattered when you messaged me. Oh, yeah. I I really make a point to like really try to remember remember every single person, what question they asked, what their name is. I try really hard. <laughs> yeah, I figured you just you meet so many people on book tour and it was like a month later, but I'm really I'm glad you did. And I'm glad to be here. Yeah, well, I'm so happy you're here. And I like to ask every guest this question before we get started. Um, What does keto mean to you? So for me, keto is really representative, not only of building a healthier relationship with food and choosing whole foods over processed ones, but for me, it also means that in a way I'm kind of taking a stand against the completely flawed model of nutrition that we've been taught our entire lives. So that feels really good to me to say, no, you know what, what we've been taught and what's being perpetuated is wrong. And this is why it works. And I'm you know, living proof that it does work. 
Yeah. And what was that process like for you to go from thinking you knew some stuff about the food you were putting in your body to being like, sorry, what? I don't understand. <laughs> I know. I have so many people asking me questions about, oh, how do you how do you eat that much fat? And I just say to them, I just got to indulge in everything that I was depriving myself of on the low carb diet. So it is not hard for me to get that much fat in at all because I love all those things. And now I can eat just about as much of it as I want to, but it's definitely a struggle that a lot of people encounter where it's, yeah, their entire view of what nutrition is and what's good for them is flipped upside down. And they're very scared that, that it's going to be dangerous for them. So it's definitely something that's, that can be difficult to wrap your head around. And you mentioned depriving your body for so long. Can we chat about that for a bit? Like before you found keto, what sort of foods were you eating? What was your relationship with food? It was so unhealthy. I had done just about every diet or detox there was. I did tea detoxes. I tried protein shake diets. And the most recent one was the if it fits your macros diet. Um, And I just became obsessed with counting macros and counting calories, tracking every morsel that entered my mouth. And food was all that I thought about. I was always thinking about my next meal and I wasn't losing any weight. I was eating a lot of rice, still quite a bit of vegetables and good protein, but a lot of lean protein. So not a lot of fatty protein. I used to, I loved chicken thighs. I was like, no, I can only have chicken breasts. There's too much fat in chicken thighs. I can't have that. And I was eating every kind of low fat version of food that I could find, which I now realize was probably the most terrible thing that I could have been doing for my body. Mm. And what's, what's life like now? It's amazing now. It's, I'm so comfortable eating just about any kind of food. Like I'm never, I never feel guilty about indulging in some of my favorite things like strawberries and whipped cream or even, you know, Halo Top ice cream. I don't feel guilty about having some spoonfuls here and there. And I'm just so much more in tune with what my body is telling me. And I'm not thinking about food all the time. I will be at work and working away until two o'clock and think, oh my gosh, I miss lunch. I have to, I should go eat something, but you know, I'm just, I'm not hungry. I don't get the sugar cravings anymore. It's just, it's a whole, it's a whole new world. Mm, And on, I think the posting that you shared when um, we took a picture on the book tour, something that you said, um, stuck with me because I felt the same way before I found keto. I really live to eat and food was such a huge part of my life. And it, and you said the same thing as like, yeah, before keto and with your yo-yo dieting um, and weight gain, it was like, I, I, I live to eat. I live to eat. Would you say that now it's just, you eat to sustain energy and just live? Yeah. I mean, part of that too before is I just, I genuinely like eating. It's a very social experience for me. It's fun. It tastes good. So it triggers, um, you know, that dopamine in your brain when it tastes good. Uh, Just the experience of eating is very enjoyable for me. And I actually said those words out loud. I was having lunch with some friends at work and the one girl would just bring like the smallest lunch every single day of the most basic thing, like a can of corn or something. And I would have, you know, my lunch and then three snacks. And I had a protein shake two hours earlier. And I said, no, I don't know how you do that. Like, I don't, I don't eat to live. I live to eat. And they all just kind of looked at me like, oh yeah, that's maybe not the best, you know, way of living. And that definitely contributed to the massive weight gain that I saw. But yeah, now it's, you know, I still do enjoy eating, but I find I savor my food a bit more. And, you know, when I do go out to eat, it's still an enjoyable social experience, but I'm just a little more wary of what I'm putting in my body And I like that I can go out to eat now and I'm not stuffing my face with a bunch of carbs and go into that carb coma later that I used to feel. I still have the energy to go out for a drink somewhere after or go dancing or, you know, hang out for another few hours without feeling so tired. And how do you manage, because it sounds like you're a social being and you like going out and all the things like, 
Do you stress about trying to find keto foods when you're out and about in the real world trying to be social? No, I, I don't really. I mean, anytime I know that I might be in a situation where there won't be many keto options for me, I'm more than happy to bring some myself, whether it's just a little bag of almonds or a little bag of cheese or um, some cured meats or something like that, even just some strawberries or raspberries. Um, so I bring my own snacks a lot of places, but I find there's always a way to make just about anything keto. So I, it's not something I stress about. And that is something that I did think would be a problem. And it hasn't, I haven't encountered it yet. Back to today's episode in a sec. Okay, so I live in tights even when I'm not working out. At the price of Lululemons, I couldn't live in tights all day. They're just, they're so expensive, right? And I end up wrecking my tights really quickly. So it feels like a complete waste of money. I found Fabletics recently, made my first order, and I've been rocking a couple of awesome tights for the last three weeks, and I just had to tell you about them. So if you haven't heard of Fabletics, let me give you the Coles Notes version. It's a website with a lot of workout wear for physical activities from the gym and beyond, and all the outfits are trending and stylish. The patterns are like unreal, and it really sets them apart from their competitors. And you know, not just like that basic black legging that costs $100. The looks that they share change often, and they're always creating new styles and patterns, and they email their VIPs when new looks are released. I've been digging these leggings so hard, I'm actually wearing a pair right now. So if you're a leggings girl and you're looking at finding a new source for leggings, I think you might want to try Fabletics. So some of my favorite features are that the pants don't roll down when I move. So the high-waisted leggings stay up around my waist. Another thing I love is that the materials aren't thin, which means when I'm squatting, bending over, lunging, downward dogging, or just walking around, in the world, everyone can't see my underwear. They are not see-through. And I tested this with my Cashel foldover power form and sculpt knit high waist mesh leggings in various lighting situations. I was bending over, I had Kevin looking at various lighting situations to see if anything was showing and nothing. Also, there are pockets in many of their styles large enough to hold a cell phone. Like, imagine that. Tights that hold stuff. A novel concept. The specific styles that I have are the Solar Mesh Power Hold and the High Waisted Mesh Power Hold leggings, both of which can hold a cell phone and more. Also, many of the styles do not show underwear lines. Anything in their power hold line will not show your underwear line. So Fabletics is offering listeners of the podcast an incredible deal you really don't want to miss. You can get two leggings for only $24. This is a $99 value when you sign up for the VIP programs. All you got to do is go to fabletics.com slash keto to take advantage of this deal now. So that's fabletics.com slash keto to get two amazing leggings for only $24. Also, you get free shipping on orders over $49. International shipping is available and there's absolutely no commitment when you purchase your first order. Again, that's fabletics.com slash keto. You'll run through a quick style quiz so that they know what to show you and what not to show you. It'll ask you for things like your sizes, what gear you're looking for, how you're going to use it. And then they put together an entire boutique just for you. So again, that's that's fabletics.com slash keto to get two leggings for 24 bucks. Enjoy it. Okay, back to today's episode. And when you first started keto, what are some of the misconceptions that you had when you first started keto to now where you're like, ooh, I wish I would have thought of this a different way? I did a lot of research before I started keto. So I kind of Googled like misconceptions about keto so that I wouldn't be so frazzled when I started it. So I think I was, I was kind of wary of that. The whole keto flu thing I managed to avoid because of the mass amount of research that I did. But I know that's, that's, a misconception that a lot of other people struggle with is that it's inevitable that you have to go through keto flu to get into ketosis and it's just not. And I guess another misconception is that it's going to be really hard and people are going to think, oh, like you, you must have worked so hard, but it turned out to be 
easier than I ever could have imagined, easier than tracking every morsel that went into my mouth and counting calories and macros. So, Mm -hmm. and so rewind back to February and then now how has your keto approach changed? Like, are you doing certain things you didn't do then that you're doing now? Definitely. So when I started keto, I was still tracking. So I used the app carb manager to log my food. And a lot of people thought it was such a big inconvenience. They're like, Oh my gosh, I don't know how you log all your food. Cause I would suggest it to people who were asking me how to get started. And I said, it just gives you an idea of portions and gives you an idea of what the percentages of fat to carb to protein is in all the foods. But I haven't been tracking probably for a month and a half now. And it's really, really liberating. And I'll still maybe log, I'll do a whole day of eating. And then the next day I'll log everything that I ate in the app just to make sure that I'm still on track and knowing what's in the foods as well as I think I do. And it's going really well. I'm still actually losing. And it's nice to have kind of this extra free time now that I'm not tracking all the food. It's very liberating. Yeah. What do you do with the extra time in the day? I'm not as productive as I probably should be. (laughs) That's okay to say nothing. I just I'll I'll figure out something to do with that extra time. You know what? Um, I was, I was in an interview earlier this morning and um, they asked me like, what do you like to do in your free time? And the first thing that popped into my head that I've been doing a lot is watching ants. Like I'll literally like sit on the ground and watch <laughs> bugs move. It's like and people like, watching, but insect watching. Yeah. Like they do crazy stuff. They like carry three other ants on their back and like giant pieces of food. And yeah. yeah. And I mean, you're yeah. learning more about, about the world you live in. And I would rather do that than track my calories. That says a lot. Like definitely. <laughs> I think I'd rather watch paint dry at this point than count my own, my calories. Yeah, totally. So would you say that you are always an intuitive person? Like, it sounds like you have to be a little bit intuitive with the strategy you're doing of like, I'm just going to write everything down and then track it the next day. Would you say that you were always intuitive or do you think that that's something that you've, you know, coached yourself through? I mean, it's, it's hard to tell really if I was intuitive before I was tracking because I just, I didn't know. But I think I definitely learned a lot in my year of tracking my macros because I learned, you know, how many grams of fat and carbs are in so many different foods. And I learned what, you know, 200 grams of chicken looks like. So I know now that when I'm having dinner, if like, if I don't have enough chicken on my plate, if I maybe have a bit too much, I know how much I can eat. I know 200 grams of chicken is maybe pushing it. So I can take a little bit off my plate. So I'm a a lot less wasteful with food. I'm not overfilling my plate, which I used to do a lot. I think that intuitive eating is not not a skill that ha- you have to be born with. I think it can be learned. Mm, yeah. And there was something else you post on social saying, um, like listening to my body and wrapping my mind around the fact that my body is a wonderful and brilliant machine capable of expressing its needs to me has been enlightening to put it mildly. I just loved that. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I mean, we've been taught our whole lives that no, our bodies are wrong. And this is, this is what we need to be eating. And this is how much we need to be eating. And it's just, it's crazy that people think that our bodies aren't capable. I mean, we can grow humans, we can fight off diseases, but we can't know when we're hungry. We have to be told when we should eat and you know, we have to be told how much we should be eating. And it just, when I say, oh, I didn't eat anything today, people gasp and they think, oh my gosh, that must be terrible for you. And I'm like, no, I, I fasted today. That's good for my body to give it a break, allow it to heal, allow my previous meal to fully digest and then start again fresh tomorrow. And it's, it's actually a healthy thing. If your body's not telling you it's hungry, it's because you're not. It has all the nutrients it needs to sustain itself for however long until you feel you need to eat again. Yeah. I love that you just, I've never put it that way where 
your body's able to heal from disease, make a human. How can you think that it doesn't know when it's hungry? It's like, <laughs> it's, that's like the most basic human need. And we think that we're smarter than that. So I have recorded probably 20 interviews at this point over the last day and a half. That was the knowledge bomb of this, <laughs> of this interview <laughs> session. Like, well, I'm flying. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I hope you're totally digging this episode. I love putting these together every week and I hope you're getting something out of it. I love seeing where you're listening from. So next time you're listening or even right now, take a picture of yourself watching the show or a screenshot of your favorite episode and tag me on Instagram at Healthful Pursuit. And if social isn't your thing, that's totally fine. Just jump on your favorite podcast player and leave a review for the show. Okay, back to the good stuff. So let's chat about cravings. Do you still, do you still struggle with cravings on keto? Like honesty time, is there certain things that you still really love or that you indulge in? Of course. I mean, I've gotten to a point where I'm very comfortable in my routine that, you know, if I go away for a weekend, I just went to my cottage for Canada day long weekend and we had s'mores at the campfire. So I had a couple s'mores. And that's not going to be the be all end all of my weight loss journey. Yeah, it might kick me out of ketosis for a couple of days, but I just, I jump right back on it the next day. I don't let myself feel guilty about that. I indulged in the situation because you can't not have s'mores at a campfire, at a cottage, on Canada Day long weekend. <laughs> like, it's just, you have to. And so I, I allowed myself that. Chocolate is probably the biggest thing that I get cravings for. There are some times where I'm like, oh gosh, I just need a chocolate bar right now. But I've also found the Lily chocolate bars and they're sweetened with stevia. They're delicious. They have like an almond, a milk chocolate, a dark chocolate one. And they're so rich because it's essentially mostly cocoa. It's very high in cocoa um, that you only need like a couple little strips of it and then you're good to go. So that really has helped to satisfy my chocolate cravings. As far as sugar cravings, it used to be a daily thing for me. And when I first started keto, I did get the really bad sugar craving the one day But I was like, no, if I give into it, it's only going to make it that much harder to transition into ketosis. So I just, I got to stave it off. I got to, I got to push through this. And it was maybe an hour that all I could think about was sugar and carbs. And then it passed. And I haven't had that kind of like overwhelming craving for it ever since. That's phenomenal. Back to today's episode in a sec. I can't tell you how many times in the past before I studied nutrition and really got into the health and wellness space that I felt completely helpless when it came to my body. I went to many health professionals and explained what I was feeling and they all kind of discounted my explanation as having depression or having ADD and just blaming certain things when I knew there was something else going on. And I know what that feels like to feel completely lost and frustrated with my body and wanting to have the knowledge to figure it out and what tests to run. And I just didn't know. And not only that is like once I get all these tests and all these numbers and and systems and how the heck am I supposed to interpret these results and action what my body is telling me in these tests? I was relying a whole lot on everyone else telling me what to do, how to do it, if you can do it. And I really like to know about my own body and I like to dig deep in understanding what's going on and when so that I can adjust what I'm doing to feel better and better every day, except for those times that I totally pound candy and like go off the rails, which happens sometimes. And then I don't feel so good the next day, but at least I know that it was all the sugar that I just ate. But for real though, accessibility to testing and understanding your body is extremely limited. So if you're looking for a solution and not one that results in you having to line up for days for an exam or then make a bunch of doctor's appointments, I highly recommend checking out Everlywell. I am just so excited about this company and can't stop talking about it with everyone I meet because it's something I've wanted for so, so long. And for this technology to exist out in the world today just blows my mind. So what happens is 
Everly Well allows you to test your blood, urine, or saliva for basically anything that you want for a ridiculously great price. So all you got to do is order the kit that you want and it outlines what it's testing for, what kind of symptoms you would have if this certain thing is an issue. So it arrives in the mail. You prick your finger or collect urine or collect saliva in a little cup. Usually you dip it in some sort of paper. Now with the blood, if you're all concerned, oh, I'm scared of needles. Don't worry about it. All you got to do for the blood sample is prick your finger with a lancet just like you would testing your blood glucose or your ketones and you just dab the blood on a piece of paper so you send these test kits back to Everlywell and within a couple of days your results are delivered to you in their secure platform and helps you interpret the results also so if you're interested in testing your hormones which I bet you might be you might want to check out the woman's fertility test or the woman's health test on their website which you can go to healthfulpursuit.com com slash well. And if you decide to go ahead with one of the tests or a bunch of different tests or whatever you want to do, you can use the coupon code KETO, all in caps, no spaces for 15% off your order. Again, that's KETO, all in caps, at healthfulpursuit.com slash well for 15% off your order. Okay, back to today's episode. So for me, it's a little bit different because I grew up around a lot of sugar and I have a lot of memories around sugar. And so every Christmas, every time I'm lonely, you know, certain times of my life, certain periods of the day, I want sugar, not because my body wants it, but because like my emotions, my brain wants it. Do you ever get that? Or is that pretty much disconnected from your reality? (laughs) For the most part, it's been pretty disconnected. I used to be a very emotional eater. Anytime something even remotely inconvenient happened in my day, I wanted to turn to food immediately. And that has been completely turned off. I'm like, when I'm bored now, if I'm sad, I don't, my initial reaction isn't to turn to food anymore, which has also been the most amazing realization. But yeah, I still do. I mean, I worked in an office where there were treats every single day and there were potlucks every single week and you ate the food because it was there. And then when it wasn't there, that craving was still there because I was so used to consistently feeding my body with these high carb, high sugar foods. So yeah, I definitely still do get some cravings uh, in terms of chocolate. Cookies are my kryptonite, but I make all the keto cookies now. I make them all the time. I just, if there's something in spe- like specifically that I'm craving, uh, like chocolate chip or peanut butter or snickerdoodle, I will Google a keto recipe for those cookies, make a huge batch of them. And then I just, I know that I don't have to feel bad about indulging in a couple of those. And that satisfies the craving immediately. Yeah. I don't understand the cookie thing. Kevin is the, he is the family cookie monster. Like he <laughs> oh, yeah. is known across our entire family to just like annihilate cookies. <laughs> Like just... I'm definitely a cookie monster. Oh like, my God. don't give me cake. Don't give me pie. Give me all the cookies and I will, I'll eat all of them. I don't even understand it. Okay. So we've chatted a lot about relationship with food and how you're feeling about food. How are you feeling about your body? Because you mentioned you had had, you had gained quite a lot of weight working at the job that you had with all the potlucks and all the things that were happening. And um, you're saying that you're still losing. What's your relationship like with your body now? It's a lot better than it was in the past. Like I was just, I was so uncomfortable. I was wearing black all the time. I hated having my picture taken. And even, you know, if I wanted to take a selfie one day, I would try it. I would take 20 and I would hate all of them and just not end up taking one or posting one or anything. Just my self-worth and my self-esteem was at its absolute lowest. And now, I mean... I'm wearing color again, not today, but I am wearing color very frequently and I'm comfortable taking pictures in a group with my girlfriends and knowing that I'm not going to hate every single picture that I'm in. I am comfortable putting on a bikini and knowing that I'm like, I don't dread it anymore because I actually went to the beach this past weekend with my friends and there were a bunch of pictures taken. I was, I didn't know that any of the pictures were being taken, but they were posted online. I was like, 
oh my gosh, I don't hate the way that I look in any of these pictures and they are 100% candid. And that is, that's an awesome feeling to have. And do you think it was about the weight or have you worked on other things outside of that to just appreciate your body? I think that it was, it was a lot to do with the weight, but I think because of the weight and not feeling comfortable in my body, I also wasn't in a good place mentally. And because I wasn't feeding my body proper nutrition, that also really lended to my mental health. And so it was very difficult to see myself in a positive way because my nutrition wasn't allowing me to, and my nutrition was contributing to my weight gain, which also did not make me feel good at all. So I think now that I'm eating properly, I'm getting so many good nutrients and I can feel good about what I'm putting in my body and it's physically showing as well, that has just transformed my mental health over the last five months. That's amazing. It Um, feels so good. And where do you hope, like when you started keto, what was like the main factor that you're like, I got to do this right now. And has that changed over time? And where do you hope to be in like six months? When I started keto initially, it was, you know, going to be my magic pill to weight loss because I had heard so many success stories. But the more I looked into it, the more I realized just how many health benefits there are to it and how even just cutting the refined sugar and the starchy carbs out of my diet is going to make me so much less prone to those degenerative diseases that are just running rampant in society today. And that just made me feel even better about making this decision. And so in six months, I just, I hope that I can just help as many people as possible get started or give them advice. I've had so many of my friends come to me after seeing the success that I've had and hearing me talk nonstop about how obsessed I am with keto. And they come to me and ask for help on how they can get started and what the hardest part of it is, uh, what the best part of it is. And I just hope to be potentially helping even more people get started with it because I truly believe that it's life changing. I'd love to pick your brain on what you tell them when you're like, yeah, here's how to get started with keto because it's been, it's been a while since I got started with keto. So I love knowing somebody who's like fresh to it. What are your recommendations? The first thing that I tell people is to start simple because I know for me, that was, I think the biggest key to my success is that I didn't overwhelm myself with, okay, I need to cook keto recipes for three meals a day, every single day, or I'm going to fail. I was like, no, I'm just going to eat cheese and avocado and eggs and salmon and almonds and chicken thighs and, you know, just eat eat until I'm full. And uh, yeah, so that's what I tell people is just to keep it as simple as possible. Because if you start looking up a bunch of recipes, and you're trying to replace things like bread immediately, you're going to be disappointed because no keto recipe for bread is ever going to taste or feel like real bread. And it's just going to be overwhelming and exhausting trying to cook keto. You're probably already cooking majority keto, just, you know, leave the rice out of your chicken and vegetables and boom, you pretty much have a keto meal right there. So that's, that's the first thing that I tell people. Mm, Yeah, that's brilliant. Okay. So what's your favorite keto thing to eat right now? So I tried to do an egg fast uh, when, uh, when I was first starting just to kind of kick me into ketosis a little bit. The recipe was posted on one of the Facebook groups that I'm in and it's for snickerdoodle crepes and it's basically three eggs, two tablespoons of cream cheese and cinnamon and it makes roughly three crepes. So you just blend up all the ingredients in a blender or a magic bullet, fry them up and then I like to wrap cut up strawberries uh, into them. And then I use some monk fruit maple flavored syrup by Lacanto and just drizzle some of that on it. And it tastes like dessert, but it's super healthy and keeps you full for hours and hours and hours. And I make it at least once a week. Wow. That's cool. I, I'm not such a huge fan of egg fasting. What was your feeling on that? 
I didn't last long, if I'm being honest. It's a, it's supposed to be about a week. Yeah, I think it's like five days, and I I might have made it to the third day, yeah. and just the sight of eggs was making me queasy. So I had to stop. But I still do love eggs. I have some sort of egg, like maybe four times a week. So yeah, yeah. But it who w- knows if you would have finished the whole fast, maybe you would hate eggs today. <laughs> exactly. So it's probably a good thing that I didn't. <laughs> I like it. What do you think is missing in the keto space uh, for women right now? Yeah, I actually, I thought a lot about this because I listen to your podcast and I hear different people's answers and everything. And I thought about what my answer would be. And I think what's missing in the keto space for women is uh, just more information on how much your diet can affect your hormones and how your hormones can actually be regulated through your diet. So I'm actually currently in the process of getting off my hormonal birth control that I've been on for about 12 years. Yay. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm a little nervous to see how my body reacts to going off of it because I tried it once and my skin broke out like crazy. And yeah, it was just terrible. So, but now that I know how bad all of these, you know, artificial hormones are going to be affecting my body and I'm getting into those childbearing years where I'm thinking about starting a family and then maybe near future. I don't want to say near future and freak out my boyfriend. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't do that. Like no. sometime in the next decade. Sometime, yes, exactly. <laughs> but I'd like to get them kind of regulated on my own. And so I think that young girls really need to start being educated on the importance of hormones in relation to their diet so they can make more informed decisions about methods of birth control later on and really think twice about going on that hormonal birth control. And I feel like women are taught that food is an enemy instead of a tool really, really early on. And it just sets the stage for an unhealthy relationship with food that can take a really long time to get past. So yeah, just uh, more information on connecting your diet to your health Mm. because they're they're just completely interrelated. Yeah, I love that. Such a beautiful answer. And with your birth control comment, I've heard multiple times that when you go off birth control, it takes the same amount of months that it did years that you were on it. So if you were on birth control for 12 I'm in years, trouble. <laughs> it'll take 12 months. Oh, I mean, I've met women that have been on birth control for 30 years. Yeah. So yeah, just be patient with the process and know yeah. that if you're actually like healing your body and working toward healing, it's ace. Don't like wait eight years like I did to like yeah. get things under control because yeah. it's a long time. No, I'm I'm looking forward to starting the process. Um, yeah, because I just I know it's going to be so much better for my body in the long run. Yeah, I love that you're able to make that decision for yourself, and you've really advocated for your own health and doing the research and really digging deep to try to figure out what is all this? Where does my body fit in this? And that's what I really liked when we were chatting just briefly at the signing. So thanks so much for sharing your story today, Shelby. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Thanks for listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. Join us again in a couple of days to discover more Keto for Women secrets for your fat-fueled life. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, recipes, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representations or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program. 